Okay, hi everybody, um, and welcome to this week's uh, center seminar. Um, I'm Patrick, and I'll be coordinating things today. Um, before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge that this meeting is being hosted on the traditional lands of the Bindal people, um, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, our expectation is that interactions during seminars are constructive, and that all attendees behave with respect and consideration for others. Um, so today, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Bob Pressey, who shouldn't really need much of an introduction here at the center. Um, he's been here since 2007, and he's a, a strong leader and really a pioneer in the field of conservation planning. Um, so his perspective on conservation and, and what it really means to, to make a difference um, has been hugely influential to many researchers and many early career researchers like myself. Um, and I also really admire the kind of continued fight and energy he continues to bring to the table to call out core actions when he sees them and try and hold people accountable. Um, Bob was one of my supervisors during my PhD. Um, and it's safe to say that getting to work for him and learn from him over the last five years has completely changed my perspective on what conservation means and how we go about making a difference. Um, and also on a deeper level, um, kind of reflecting on values and decision-making and, and how we actually quantify things like impact, um, which was a concept he introduced me to, as well as counterfactual thinking and uh, quantifying confounding variables. And I think that the important thing there is that a lot of us are trying to make a difference in the work we do, um, but we often fall into traps that so often limit the difference that we're able to make, or we fail to measure what really matters. And I think this is where Bob's work is really um, really, really important. Um, and lastly, I think the other cool thing is how overcomplicated we often make things in conservation when really what we do can be boiled down to some pretty simple concepts like uh, saving stuff. <laughs> um, so with that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Bob. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, saving stuff is, is a really good place to start. So here you see the title slide. I hope you can see the title slide. As I was just saying to Pat and Eva, this is my first Zoom seminar. Um, so let's think about saving stuff. Here's a diagram. Vertical axis, uh, biodiversity remaining, time on the horizontal. Now, um, we know that we're losing biodiversity. Um, and we would like to think the green line that by establishing protected areas, and I will lapse into calling them reserves quite often, uh, just for shorthand during the seminar, that we have made a difference. We've actually um, mitigated the loss of biodiversity by establishing those protected areas. We would also like to think in the future even though we know that biodiversity is continuing and will continue to decline, that we could make more difference by establishing more protected areas. Now, um, when Pat said saving stuff, this, this is a really important, simple, but nonetheless misunderstood concept. By saving stuff, we mean how much difference we make. Uh, how much would have been lost compared to how much was lost because of our intervention. And Pat referred to impact. That's what we mean by impact, conservation impact. Unfortunately, there are lots of takes on what saving means. And often it is how many square kilometers of protected area we have established on the land or in the ocean. And what I hope you will be convinced about by the time this seminar is finished is that square kilometres of protected areas and how much we save are not at all the same things. So the worthless lands, um, I used it in the seminar title because it's a catchy phrase. Um, it has a history, a really interesting history. Um, there's a guy called Alfred Runty, he was an American historian, got himself in quite a few arguments by calling out what I regard as, as truth. Uh, 
Um, he wasn't averse to provocative titles. As you'll see with his uh, paper in 1972, it's useless, so why not a park? Yellowstone, the archetypal national park. Uh, the point that he was making is that in order for it to become a national park, Congress had to be convinced there was nothing useful there in terms of logging, mining, grazing, or other extractive industries. That's an historical fact. In his book in 1979 on National Parks, the American Experience, one of his chapters was called The Worthless Lands, in which he elaborates on the previous point. Um, it's, I like it because it has a lot of rhetorical force and it is provocative. It's been widely picked up in the literature. People have said in Argentina or Chile or um, Tasmania or wherever that what we're looking at is uh, what Runty called the worthless lands tendency. It's also been, as you would expect, highly controversial. Uh, there was a vigorous debate in the uh, Journal of Forest History in the early 1980s, and some of that debate continues. Um, lots of people don't actually like the idea that national parks have been called worthless. Um, I've, I will propose a, an alternative term, which is residual. Um, that might seem fairly derogative as well, but it doesn't carry the same uh, absolute meaning, if you like. Let me explain what I mean by that. Um, here's something we did in the late 1990s in New South Wales, um, northeastern New South Wales. We found, and in this graph, I hope you can see my pointer, um, fertility is high at three, slope is steep at three. Um, what we found is most of the reserves were in steep, infertile country, um, and very few reserves were in flat, fertile country. Um, that's what I mean by residual. There's a tendency for reserves to be in the country that isn't useful for extractive activities. In this case, logging, grazing, agriculture is a different take on the whole thing um, from the same area, but you can see an inverse relationship between the total reserved of each of those 81 environments and their suitability for clearing uh, based on physical characteristics. Here's something we have underway in the Queensland Park system. Uh, and you'll be getting the idea by now that I do, I still do work on terrestrial areas as well as marine. Um, what we've got here is uh, two time slices. Um, we've, we, we've got decadal data on this actually. Uh, 1957, as you can see, 2019, the vertical axis being percent representation and we're looking at each of these dots as a regional ecosystem in Queensland. There are 1,500 of them. And you can see there's an inverse trend between cropping suitability and percent reserved. So this is what I mean by residual. It's not an absolute term, which is why I, I like the term worthless as a title for a paper or a seminar, but I, I then switch to this idea of residual. Um, so it refers to a tendency and avoids uh, fairly unproductive arguments about strict interpretations of what is absolutely worthless. And there's been some of that. Um, and it's been widely observed on land. And I'll come back to that shortly. Now, um, I'm in a coral reef studies center. What about C? Could, could this phenomenon actually occur in the sea. Sadly, yes. Uh, in 2015, we published this paper and we had uh, three, three perspectives. We had a global analysis. Uh, we had analysis of the Australian Commonwealth uh, marine waters, which are very extensive. 
and we had an analysis of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. And in every case, we found that um, reserves were going where they were least needed uh, and most convenient for allowing uh, ongoing extraction of gas, oil, and fish. Um, late last year, we published a paper that picked up the story with um, Australia's uh, Commonwealth Marine Waters. Um, we looked at the uh, original designation of marine parks in 2012, their revision in 2015, and their revision again in 2018 um, by looking at the, the composition of the committees that and, and the governments that uh, put those committees in place that were set up to review these um, marine parks, it was predictable that a largely residual marine park system in 2012 was made more residual in 2015 and more so in 2018. Um, now, this, uh, this uh, shot here is from a conversation article that came out of that paper. And um, basically the story is, this is how percentages can be deceptive. About half of the Australian um, Commonwealth orders are in some sort of marine park. The actual protection from fishing is 2%. And that's because the no fist zones are placed where there is no fishing and the other zones are placed to allow fishing uh, more or less as it was before. All right, now um, for a long time, and uh, you'll see from the abstract, I've been wrestling with this. In fact, my first paper on this was 1994, um, but for about 10 years now, I've, I've been talking about putting together a comprehensive review of residual reservation on land. There is another one underway that I have underway in the sea. And I'm going to put up a complicated diagram in a minute, which you don't, this is one of those diagrams where the speaker says you don't have to actually take too much notice because I'm going to unpack it bit by bit. But let me just give you an overview so what we've got here is uh, a goal to reduce biodiversity loss. The fact that we end up largely with residual protected areas, these yellow arrows pointing to the immediate consequences of residual protection, and these arrows pointing to the longer term or ultimate consequences. The blue boxes being mechanisms or facilitating characteristics and these gray boxes being the reasons or the causes. Okay, now let's start working through that. I'll just keep an eye on the time here because um, I'm prone to talking too long. All right, so we have this goal. Um, we want to reduce biodiversity loss by establishing protected areas. There are other ways of doing it, of course, but protected areas are a pretty important way of doing it. Um, and yet we end up with largely residual protected areas. Um, Katie Sandbrook, who's tuned into the seminar, has helped me enormously uh, over the last year or two. Um, so the idea that, uh, that we've been pursuing is to set up systematic searches of data, oh, sorry, publications on this topic. Katie then vets them according to various criteria that I've set up and passes me the ones that are promising or might be relevant. And then I read through those and we go from there. Um, that's given us 315 studies starting in 1966 to 2020. So these are independent observations of uh, the 
the phenomenon of residual reservation on land. The paper that I'm working on at the moment um, will discuss all these and also deal with counter arguments. So for example, some people will say, well, if protected areas are partially or entirely revoked because they've been found to have extractable resources in them, doesn't that argue against the, the residual tendency that you're proposing or, or, or Alfred Runty's uh, worthless land thesis? Um, Runty himself answered this by saying, no, it doesn't. What it means is that when people realize that by some oversight, something useful has been locked up in a national park, um, someone will change the boundaries to free it up. And that simply reinforces the idea that parks should have nothing useful in them. There are other counter arguments that, uh, of course, it protected areas contain exploitable resources. Some of those can be dealt with by saying, well, we're not talking about absolutely worthless. Um, some of them can be dealt with by saying that uh, pressures change, threats change uh, and intensify. So some areas that could have been considered residual 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, are now sought after because somebody has found something in them or um, other resources have been so depleted that uh, they want what's in the reserve. Um, and none of that, uh, none of those arguments are invalid, they're true. Um, <clears throat> it just means that things change and the idea of residual reservation changes over time. But um, some people have actually used that argument to say, why don't we just get anything we can, stick it in the reserve, because sooner or later, everything will be threatened. Um, now, um, there's a problem with that. So here's a photo of the Amazon basin. Uh, and you can see the intact interior, and you can see various deforestation fronts moving into that interior. So one argument might be leave, leave the deforestation front, go and stick some reserves in the middle where they're currently safe. And by the time the deforestation front hits them, we'll at least have some reserves, fingers crossed. Um, but that also means walking away from the fragments that are in this deforestation front, um, which have their own biodiversity values. So intuitively, you would think that uh, a sensible strategy would be to balance protection of the deforestation front with the interior. Um, and pretty well that stands up to analysis because if we take an overall objective for what we're trying to achieve in this region, um, what we find is that a portfolio of areas that are at risk imminently versus possibly at risk down the track is the smartest way to go. Um, I can't enlarge too much more on that, but there are a number of papers that I can point you to if anyone's particularly interested. All right, now, um, some of the consequences of residual protected areas is one of them is exaggerated conservation achievement. Um, we can say that we have uh, in Australia, I, I don't know what the stats are for Australia, but um, in Queensland, something like 12% protection. Um, some people would regard that as a lot. Some people would regard that as too much. Is it, does it mean we've protected 12% of biodiversity? Actually, no, because in Queensland, most of those protected areas are where nobody wanted to graze or crop or log or mine. Um, so 12% is, is a very misleading figure. The impact of protected areas in Queensland and most other places is much, much smaller, uh, a tiny, tiny percentage of that. 
Um, low productivity in protected areas because we tend to go for the high, rocky, cold, infertile, steep, disease-ridden, etc. Uh, areas for protection worldwide. Uh, it means we have um, lower productivity in protected areas, and that has some flow on effects, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, it also means, of course, that we have loss of unprotected biodiversity. So these, um, uh, these blue boxes indicate that while we are protecting areas that at the moment are largely not in need of protection, um, threatening processes are expanding and wiping out the biodiversity outside protection. Um, there are limitations of restoration and recovery, severe limitations in terms of cost and extent. There are also limitations of off-park protection uh, in terms of security and effectiveness. Now, I su suggest for marine folks that these two are probably the major difference between the terrestrial situation and the marine situation in that very often, most often, conversion of terrestrial environments means pretty well total loss of biodiversity and pretty well zero chance of restoration and recovery with some, some minor exceptions. I'm not sure that's true in the marine environment. Um, so that might change the interpretation of this picture for marine areas somewhat. All right, now, um, the ultimate consequences of all this, uh, loss of protect, unprotected biodiversity, um, every conservation decision involves an opportunity cost in that you could have spent the money or the resource, other resources somewhere else. But in the case of ongoing loss, your opportunity costs are irretrievable. You won't get them back, at least in the terrestrial environment. Um, some people have suggested trading protected areas, the ones that are not very effective at the moment to, to get more effective ones. Um, if you look carefully at the data on which they're based, they're fairly shaky, but there's a fundamental problem with that argument, which is if we make protected areas less secure than they are now, so that they can in fact be removed and shuffled, who would do the removing and the shuffling? Would it be a conservation scientist in a university? And I'm not saying that would be the best outcome at all. Um, would it be Scott Morrison uh, or one of his ministers? Um, that worries me a lot. So the national parks and nature reserves in many places are secure for a very good reason, which is it's really hard to get rid of them. Um, that means, of course, when you put them in the wrong places, it's still hard to get rid of them. But in this case, uh, if, if someone cynically wanted to remove them, um, they have some security against that. Right, now combine low productivity in protected areas with ongoing loss around those protected areas, and what you end up with is jeopardized persistence. Um, partly because um, a lot of the populations in low productivity protected areas, even though their ranges were, were once much bigger, are sink populations, not source populations. Um, so they're on their way out unless they're subsidised. And of course, as protected areas become more isolated, and things like seasonal migration is prevented, then the things that live in those protected areas are less likely to persist. Reserve fatigue, okay. Now, um, 
facilitated by decreasing tolerance for increasing protected area extent. A lot of people think we've got enough protection, thanks very much. Um, reserve fatigue is a really interesting phenomenon. I, I've been working in conservation since uh, my early National Parks days in about 86, 87. And I've been told lots of times that you guys have got enough reserves and you have to let the rest of us just get on with it. Um, now, it's, it's a really hard thing to document. I'm sure it's out there. Um, I have no doubt that it's out there. I've thought about ways in which it could be documented um, empirically. I've, I've not done much about that yet. But there, there is a point at which society says enough is enough. Um, you've got enough. You guys have got enough reserves and you should just lay off and let the rest of us get on with it. Now, that can be gamed to some extent, but uh, and we, we're watching governments gain uh, the 30% by 2030 targets right now by uh, rebadging reserves and, um, and uh, in, in, in other ways making out that uh, we've done a bloody good job, um, even though we haven't. Right, now, reasons. Preemption. I'll, um, sorry, a feedback loop. Um, Preemption, I'll, I'll enlarge on this in a minute. Preemption refers to uh, development, conversion, actually getting in first and leaving limited options for conservation. Um, that is fed by irretrievable opportunity costs. Resistance means um, governments in particular uh, resisting the reservation of areas because they want to develop a country or a state and they want to use natural resources to do that. Um, the, the trap there, of course, is the longer the resistance goes, the more preemption there is. Um, feedback from reserve fatigue to resistance. I'll enlarge on all of these, but revoking and weakening protected areas is also a cause of residual reservation. Misconceived targets and objectives, I won't say any more about that until I get to the slide down the track. And likewise, incidental reserve residual focus. So I've got five very broad categories of causes here. Uh, and now I'll, I'll work through each one and give you some ideas about what they're about. Just taking a sip of a drink here. Um, my, I don't have a webcam at the moment. And um, so I was talking to uh, Eva earlier, uh, saying that you, you won't know whether I'm sipping water or brandy and dry or something else. actually brandy and dry. Um, right. So obviously in many regions, much loss of biodiversity predated reserves. And a lot of it accompanied the growth of reserve systems. And we see that in Australia in particular and the US. Um, you could say that um, given all that, preemption that reserves are doing you know, a pretty good job under difficult circumstances. A couple of problems with that. Um, as I said before, uh, ongoing pressure to reserve only residual areas exacerbates preemption. Um, and the other is that if we look at residual bias in terms of remaining biodiversity, we find the same sort of trend. So here's an example from northeastern New South Wales, 81 uh, abiotic environments, percent total reserved on the vertical axis, suitability for clearing on the horizontal. But if we change the vertical axis to percent of remaining vegetation reserved, 
we still get a very obvious inverse trend. In other words, we're staying away from even remaining vegetation that is suitable for clearing. And there's a bunch of reasons for that that I don't have time to go into. Resistance. Let's uh, remember, and this, this is foremost in my mind almost all the time when I think about what we do about all this, there are very, very powerful forces driving residual reservation. And all of that is well documented. Um, we have lobbying from extractive in interests. There was a news item today that uh, Australian firms involved in fossil fuels have a much, much greater lobbying presence uh, to government in Australia than firms that are promoting renewable energy. Uh, a lot of us know that, and there's a lot of money involved. There's political ideology and not just on the side of the Conservatives. Um, there are, there, there's a lot of misleading rhetoric uh, that the electorate picks up because let's face it, most voters are focused because they have to be on doing their jobs, raising their kids. They're worried about health. They're worried about education. They're worried about tax. Um, they kind of like the idea of conservation, but they're not very discerning about it. So there can be a lot of misrepresentation by politicians and sadly by some NGOs who don't seem to get the problem. Uh, there's, yes, institutionalized resistance to locking up from extractive uses at multiple levels. Um, there's the tendency for uh, to look for quick hits, um, usually related to extent or representation uh, that don't necessarily tell us about how much difference we're making. Um, and quite validly in many regions and countries, um, there's, there's issues of social justice and livelihoods. There are people who uh, uh, should not be thrown off their farms uh, because uh, conservation needs to take over. Uh, we need to be much more uh, sophisticated about the way we achieve conservation goals in, in those regions. Um, yes, and I've already said that, that resistance is exacerbated by reserve fatigue. Uh, people say enough is enough. You guys have got truckloads of reserves out there. Uh, just let us get on with the, the rest of it, please. Revocation and weakening. Um, by revocation, I mean, you, you might have read papers about PADDD, downgrading, downsizing and degazettement. Uh, there are lots of examples worldwide. Um, and as I said, uh, some people might say, well, revocation means that uh, they weren't residual, but the other side of it is that revocation makes them more residual than they were um, because there's this view that uh, we should not be locking up things that we could use for profit. Um, another example is uh, of weakening is diminishing management resources. Uh, we've got a, a, another study in Queensland about to be published, I hope. Uh, which shows that um, uh, there was a big management, a shortfall in management spending relative to that required to achieve the good overall level. These are levels that were worked out with managers in workshops. Um, more importantly, the bulk of that shortfall uh, related to biodiversity activities, not visitor activities. Uh, because visitor activities are the one that's, ones that people notice and complain about. They don't notice if biodiversity is declining. Um, 
Misconceived targets and objectives. Now, um, the IT targets um, that are now being replaced that were meant to get us through to 2020 required 17% of land, 10% of the sea to be put in protection. There were qualifiers, but they were not quantitative. Uh, and so anyone could play those for whatever they wanted. Sorry if that sounds cynical, but I've been around for long enough to be cynical. Um, now we have, instead of 17% and 10%, we have 30%. Um, I'm not all that optimistic about that unless we really get our act together and say, what do we mean by those percentages? Because what, what we know up to 2020 is that they, those percentages stimulated a race to the bottom, whereby governments and NGOs racked up as many percentages as they could, uh, effective or otherwise, mostly not effective, to say, yes, we've got there, thanks very much. Um, and we have to do everything we can to avoid repeating that for 30% targets between now and 2030. Um, yes, so um, there are some problems even with representation and I've been a long time champion of representation in protected areas, which means getting a good sample of species and ecosystems and landscapes um, that can be bent accidentally or deliberately in a number of ways. So uh, representing 17% of an ecoregion, which is quite a big thing, uh, can be done by representing the cheapest and least need, uh, the cheapest areas and the areas least in need of protection in that ecoregion. There are a number of other uh, weaknesses. Um, and weakening of policy targets over time. Uh, I've written about this recently. If you want to uh, have a look at that, ping me and uh, I'll send you a copy. But uh, what we've seen in Australia since about the mid 90s is a progressive weakening of uh, policy statements about protected areas. And we're now at the point where you could drive a truck through them and still claim victory. What I mean by incidental residual focus is that there are lots of reasons for protecting areas that are not imminently threatened by extractive activities. Oops, sorry. Um, here are some of them. Now, none of those are, are, are bad, they're all good. Um, but they can promote NGOs and governments to think, hey, we could go and protect some wilderness or mega corridors and we won't piss anybody off. Uh, we won't interfere with mining or logging or grazing or agriculture and we'll do some cool stuff and we'll look good. Um, every one of those decisions has an opportunity cost. Um, the debit side of the balance sheet. So in investing in climate change adaptation or scenery or even catchments, what else are you not investigating that could disappear? Um, investing in, sorry, um, that could disappear uh, in the near future. Um, this is someone who said it better than me. Such publicizing of gains, but not losses is misleading, akin to reporting revenue without expenses and calling it net profit. Uh, in many cases, that's what we're doing. Where do we go from here? So um, I've spent all of this seminar and a lot of time in, over the last mm, 20 years or so, talking about this phenomenon and now elaborating on the causes and consequences. Mm, what's changed? 
Um, I'm not sure. I think the people that were going to get the message pretty well got it. I would like to think it's changed things a bit, but I don't have any information to back that up, really. So where do we go from here? Um, I am looking for now, now that I'm writing up all of this ways forward, how conservation scientists like me who can expose these situations and uh, write them up and publicize them can move forward and make positive change. Uh, here's a few things, uh, not exhaustive, that I think we can do. <clears throat> we need to get involved in discussions about policy targets. I'm trying to do that. Other people are too. Um, we need to get involved in debate management. In parentheses, be careful what you wish for. Um, over my time in conservation science since 87, I've been involved in a number of planning management projects. Some of them have been the best experiences I've ever had. And I worked with some of the best people I've ever worked with. Some of them have been <laughs> disasters and you don't know upfront. So that's what I mean by be careful what you wish for. You should get involved. Um, sometimes it doesn't work out. How do we start to understand uh, residual decision making and its influences so that we can start to tweak those influences and ameliorate the adverse effects. Uh, quantitative assessments, yes, uh, done lots of that. They do matter. People sit up and, and take notice, but it doesn't necessarily change the way the world works. Impact evaluations, uh, Pat referred to impact in his introduction, impact and, and that diagram that I had up at first, impact is the difference we make, it's how much we save. We can do that retrospectively for established protected areas. Uh, more importantly, we can predict where we can have most impact in the future and we can feed that information to decision makers. Um, accessible articles, maybe, you know, the, the nice thing about the, conserva, uh, the conversation is you can, you can talk about a paper you wrote um, and the paper might eventually, if you're doing well, get 200 citations. Uh, an article in the conversation along those lines might get 10,000 reads. Um, how good is that? I don't know. Uh, are, are we still preaching to the converted? Uh, are we making some difference? I don't know, but I'll keep writing them. What about report cards on reserve systems? What about uh, setting up a report card system that looks at, even in Australia, reserve system state by state in terms of uh, how residual they are, how well managed they are, how much difference they're actually making. That seems to me to be a, a useful thing to do at some stage. I might have another point or might not. No, that's it. Okay. Um, that's 